with the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Well, good evening once again, and thank you all for joining us this evening. Uh, tonight's meeting is being broadcast live by Boston City TV on YouTube, as well as Comcast Channel 24, RCN Channel 13, and Fios Channel 1962. It will be rebroadcast at a later date. Uh, I want to note that we do have interpretation services available once again this evening in Spanish. Will the Spanish interpreter please raise his hand and introduce himself? Gracias, Juan. Uh, if you'd like to sign up for public comment this evening, please see our staff person, Ms. Lena Parvex, out in the hallway. Uh, sign up this evening. We'll uh, close for both public comment periods at 6.30 p.m. sharp. We'll move on now to the approval of minutes from the October 30th school committee meeting. If the meetings are approved, as, or excuse me, are approved as presented, hard copies will be made available in the hallway with uh, the handouts immediately following the vote. If changes are made, you can access the minutes tomorrow on the BPS website. At this time, I'd like to entertain a motion to approve the minutes of the October 30th, 2019 meeting as presented. So moved. Thank you, Ms. Robinson. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Mr. O'Neill. Is there any discussion or objection to the motion? Is there any discussion to, uh, excuse me, objection to approving the minutes by unanimous consent? Hearing none, the minutes are approved. We'll move on now to the superintendent's report. I present to you our superintendent, Dr. Brenda Consentis. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thanks everyone for joining us this evening. I'd like to shine, uh, share a few highlights from around the district and um, some of the updates from the past week. Um, of course, you know about our student poll workers on Election Day. We just had Election Day yesterday. We're thrilled to continue the student poll worker program for the third year here in Boston Public Schools. It's a partnership with the City of Boston Election Department, BPS History and Social Studies Department, and the Boston Student Advisory Council and the BPS Intergovernmental Relations Office. Through the program, about 50 of our students age 16 plus work as election officers on Election Day. Our students helped with checking voters in and out, assisting voters with mobility issues, and even using their multilingual assets to act as language interpreters. In addition to helping coordinate the program, our History and Social Studies Department also curated resources on teaching about the election process to encourage conversations in the classroom. It's so great to see our students becoming civically engaged and getting involved in their community. And I'd like to congratulate all of the new public servants who won their races yesterday. I look forward to working with you on, and the mayor on behalf of our children and families. Yesterday, we also celebrated the Higginson Lewis uh, K2 playground uh, and did a ribbon cutting. Uh, Chair Lacanto joined me and Mayor Walsh and also Ana Tavares, their superintendent, and other city officials uh, and BPS staff for the ribbon cutting of the new playground at the Higginson K2, K2 or the Baby Higginson. We enjoyed a lovely Zoom performance and also got to enjoy some homemade cookies that Principal Marie Mullen is known for. They're the best cookies in the world, who is retiring next week after six years uh, leading the school and more than 35 years in the Boston Public Schools. We announced to Principal Mullins, to her complete surprise, that at our next meeting of the Boston School Committee, we will propose that this brand new inclusive playground be dedicated to her for her unwavering commitment to her students, the Higginson community, and Boston Public Schools. Thank you, Principal Mullen, for your leadership. It's truly inspiring. I'm also super excited to report that Horace Mann School for the Deaf and Hard of Hearing uh, has acquired its dual language recognition. Earlier today, we announced to the school community that Horace Mann School for the Deaf and Hard of Hearing is officially designated dual language school for American Sign Language and English. 
The dual language recognition will allow the Horace Mann to realize its vision for students to graduate on grade level for reading and writing in English and academic American Sign Language through providing ASL as a common and shared language that all children in the school can access and all at all times. Over the past few uh, years, educators at the Horace Mann have visited 10 regional and national schools for the deaf who are implementing a bilingual or dual language program, meticulously adopting best practices and taking learnings back to their community to define, outline, and build a dual language program that is responsive to the unique needs of the school and its students. The Horace Mann remains dedicated to continual learning from similar schools while simul uh, simultaneously charting its own path to successful implementation of a dual language program. The Horace Mann, the oldest day school for the deaf and hard of hearing in the United States, is also celebrating its 150th anniversary this year with a big gala this weekend. So it's the perfect time for this designated designation to become official. Congratulations to the headmaster, Maritza Silberto, and all the staff and students at the Horace Mann. I wanted to give you just an update on the community tour. We're entering the last few weeks of the community tour before Thanksgiving, and as of this evening, I have visited 98 schools and attended 86 community meetings. <laughs> During one of my school visits to the Gru Elementary in Hyde Park, I'd like to highlight, we presented the Best in Class for Excellence in Custodial Services Award to John Kane. Our facilities team noted that Mr. Kane is one of the most dependable custodians in the entire district. Thank you, Mr. Kane, for all you do for our community. Now getting back to the community tour, in the last week, since we met just last Wednesday, I've held a meeting in Mattapan and Hyde Park communities at the New Mission High School this past Saturday a meeting with the Latinx community co-hosted by Greater Boston Latino Network and La Alianza Hispana. And thank you, Vice Chair um, Olivia Davila, for uh, joining us there. And this is my third meeting in this room in the past 24 hours. Yesterday evening, we met with the Citywide Parent Council. Um, and this morning, I had a meeting, and it was a full room packed with our partners, uh, organizations, uh, for our breakfast to discuss the development of our many Boston uh, Public School partnerships and to give us uh, feedback on their perceptions of our strategic direction. Mm -hmm. We have some additional meetings coming up that I want to make sure you are aware of and that are on your radar. Um, let me get out my little flyer. There's a flyer right outside. You can pick that up. But we'll be in Dorchester uh, in South Boston on Thursday, November 14th from 6 to 8 p.m. at the Community Academy of Sciences and Health and Boston Arts Academy. We'll be in Roxbury on uh, November 21st from 6 to 8 p.m. at Dearborn STEM Academy. Jamaica Plain, Roslindale and West Roxbury Monday, November 25th from 6 to 8 and Dorchester uh, at Henderson Upper School, Tuesday, December 3rd from 6 to 8. We just held our City Parent Council meeting. Uh, we will be in Dorchester and Roxbury this Thursday for a Parent Council meeting, uh, and then again in Jamaica Payne and Roslindell and West Roxbury Tuesday, November 12th for another Parent Council meeting, uh, 6 to 7.30. So those will be the final uh, tour meetings, uh, and then we will hold retreat uh, also as we finish up and prepare uh, next week uh, for the retreat and then also uh, prepare our first draft recommendations after Thanksgiving break. And with that, I will conclude my comments. Well, thank you, Superintendent. I'll open it up now to members for questions and discussion. I just have uh, two quick comments. Um, first of all, Superintendent, thank you for uh, announcing about the Horace Mann School. Congratulations on the dual certification, and I was a little surprised you didn't actually announce that in American Sign Language, because <laughs> that was my biggest takeaway when we visited together, that you're actually somewhat proficient in it. So. Somewhat proficient, but not fluent. <laughs> but that's, uh, but that's great practicing. news, and congratulations uh, to the school. And also, Superintendent, you mentioned you met with a number of partners this morning. I wonder if you have any takeaways or thoughts from what you heard. I'm intrigued by that, because that has been a big thing we have heard about is, you know, quite frankly, BPS is a tough partner, tough organization to partner with. 
Um, businesses know that, nonprofits know that, um, organizations know that, and I'm interested, you know, what you heard and what were some of your takeaways from that? Yeah, so um, thanks for that question. It, it really wasn't, um, I didn't hear a lot of negative um, comments about it's hard to partner. What I did hear was that they want to have more guidance in the partnerships and they want to be more equitable about how they choose who they partner with and they want that to be adequately resourced. So I think that those were the biggest uh, takeaways that I had was that our partners are very eager to partner with us, that they have a rich uh, complement of services that I think our children and our families can benefit from. And so I think that it'll be really uh, critical for us as we look at our partnership office, as I begin to develop the um, Boston um, Foundation um, and work that we're going to be doing, the development work, that we're very intentional about where we select partners where schools uh, actually match their need and the mission of the organization. So I think crossing the T's and dotting the I's and ensuring that there's equitable distribution of the partnerships across all our Boston public schools uh, was a concern that they had, which is also a concern that I hear uh, when I'm going out and doing my engagement. That's, uh, that's great to hear that you're picking that up because I do think, you know, we have some school leaders that are very, very, very successful at generating partnerships for their local school. But we have a lot of school leaders at well that are very good at other things, and that's not necessarily a strength for them. So kind of under the rationale of we have to teach them of how to fish, yeah. I'm glad to hear that you're rethinking that. And um, a lot of uh, businesses and nonprofits and organizations want to know how they can approach a district and have the district guide them on where they should be, where they can add most value, and where it aligns with an individual school's needs, what that school population's strengths and weaknesses are, et cetera. So, I'm glad to hear you're, you're thinking about that, and, and, and I'll be honest with you because we have to be truth tellers to you. Mm -hmm. If you didn't hear a lot of negatives of what it's like to be a partner with BPS, they were, they were being polite because <laughs> it was your first meeting. Well, so we can be a very difficult organization to partner with, and if we can free that up, mm -hmm. we can unlock a lot of potential. Yes, we can, and I'm glad that you used a Minnesota uh, metaphor about fishing. <laughs> Because yes, we can. I was thinking more of the biblical analogy, but sure, we'll go with. <laughs> we can, I mean, te we can, we can teach them to fish, but we're going to make sure that they know how to bait their own hook. <laughs> okay, perfect. Very good. Uh, thank you, Mr. O'Neill. Are there any other uh, comments or questions from the committee? Well, I just want to make a couple uh, quick remarks. First of all, I, I wanted to remark on yesterday's uh, election. So I want to congratulate all the winners. Uh, there's a number of new. Uh, members that will be joining the City Council and I know we're going to have a recount for uh, one of those seats but regardless of the outcome we'll have a, a, our first Latina uh, representing the City on the City Council. Well you know it's um, it's important because you know we're all we're all children of immigrants right um, and I think it, as we all look back in our own respective uh, histories, when the Irish came to this city, when uh, my forefathers came to this city uh, Italian, as Italian immigrants, each of us felt an enormous sense of pride and representation of our uh, communities when uh, representatives of our communities were able to rise up and achieve uh, positions in uh, elected office. And so I congratulate um, the uh, Latinx community in Boston. It's been I think is, uh, as is evident by the f uh, look on the face of the vice chair and Dr. Rivera, uh, way overdue, um, Evelyn. and Evelyn as well. Um, and so uh, I'm uh, looking forward to working together collaboratively uh, with our, uh, our partners on the city council, as we always have, uh, for the best outcomes for our students. I also wanted to take a moment. Um, I thought about uh, whether I should have, um, should remark on this, because I typically don't remark on uh, media coverage of the committee, but I feel compelled to do so uh, this time around because I feel that I failed um, my fellow f uh, committee members last week. Um, there was an article in the Herald and uh, I had a bad day. Uh, some of us can uh, have those and I'm sure we can relate to that. Um, when I spoke to the reporter and I chose not to comment and that reflected poorly on uh, this body and my fellow members and I'm sorry, I'm truly sorry for that. Uh, with my fellow members, but I also feel compelled to defend the integrity of this uh, committee because I took it upon myself to call the, the reporter and apologize the next day. And there was another story written, but I didn't think it fully captured uh, the work that we do as a committee. And you know, when I'm thinking about the work that we do, um, 
I think about what this body represents. And this body represents all corners of Boston. We're all colors, we're all nationalities, we're all genders. Many of us are parents. In fact, um, the majority of this body is parents uh, for the first time in a long time. Uh, we're alums, uh, we're parents of alums. Uh, we're professionals, we have lawyers, we have uh, professionals in higher ed, uh, we have uh, child advocates, financial professionals, youth organizers. We cover all different areas of the city and uh, all the very important backgrounds that you need to run an organization as large as the Boston Public Schools is with 10,000 employees, 57,000 students, 125 schools. And we br bring those perspectives that we have in our professional backgrounds and our places in our respective communities all across this city uh, to dedicate ourselves to uh, success and better outcomes for students every day. And so that's why, you know, when I think about the work that we do and the, wor and the way that we were portrayed in that story, you know, we have five and six hour meetings twice a month. We serve on committees like the Superintendent Search Committee that met um, very aggressively over the course of the year. Uh, and I, I should mention had for the first time a, vo a fully voting student member um, and came away with a, uh, a candidate that was uh, roundly uh, supported by uh, all corners of the community. And that's not something that we find very often in our, in our schools. Um, you know, we serve outside these chambers on, <coughs> on our um, task forces working towards uh, better outcomes for uh, special, uh, special needs students, English language learners, um, we want to make sure that uh, parents understand uh, how they can choose their schools and what, uh, what are the uh, best quality measures for those schools. Uh, and quite frankly, you know, I'm proud of the outcomes that we've seen in the last uh, half dozen years on this committee. Uh, we've got more schools, uh, more higher performing schools than we ever have had in this district. And I know we, we tend to uh, poo-poo it every, uh, every now and again when we talk about the fact that we're spending more on education in the city than we ever have before, but it's true. It's just the God's honest truth, and it's true. And it's because we are putting more uh, resources into the classrooms every day to support our students and try to close opportunity and achievement gaps. And so, you know, when we talk about the way in which we take action, when we vote uh, on policy recommendations, we don't take that that duty lightly. We take these policy recommendations from the professionals in our district. We ask our committee, uh, excuse me, we ask the district to make recommendations to us on issues that are important to us. And in fact, you'll hear one a little bit later on the code of conduct that came as a direct result of uh, what this committee heard last week in testimony on our wellness policy. Um, and you know, we never take votes in the same meeting. And the reason, uh, uh, the reason for that is that we don't want to act rashly. We want to have an opportunity to debate this. We want to have an opportunity to think about the policy recommendations that are put before us. We want to be able to have an opportunity to hear from the public, and there's many of you here tonight that are going to uh, talk to us about a diverse set of issues. And you know, one of the things that we even took a step on last year, and this was at the recommendation of uh, Mrs. Robinson, uh, was on our major policy votes to add an additional meeting in between when a policy is presented to us and the vote is taken so that we have an additional opportunity to ask questions of the district and hear feedback from the public. And you know, what happens from all of that? We make policies better. Off, more often than not, when you see a policy that comes before this body uh, on a recommendation from the district, it's not the same policy that passes this body because we've made it better and the public has made it better through this process. That's consensus building, that's professionalism, and that's what I expect from this committee, and that's how good policy is made. And so, you know, that gives me hope. That gives me um, always an optimistic outlook for, you know, what are, what's, what's uh, in the future for this district. You know, I am always hopeful, and it's because of the people that I work with, and I'm very proud and humbled to work with each one of you. So I just wanted to say that um, I think I might be going on a little bit long, but um, I wanted to make sure that uh, I, uh, I remarked on something that I think was in the public uh, dialogue and should, uh, deserve, uh, should deserve a response. Um, may I say something? Sure, Vice Chair, thank you. Thank you. You've said? Um, I just wanted to say thank you for saying that, uh, for the apology and for um, explaining. I, I have to say, I. Um, 
I agree with what you've said, and I it, it makes me sad as a community member um, because I think that we spend so much time here and we put so much thought into the decisions that are made and we don't take them lightly, and I wish that um, it was better captured. Um, obviously, you need to be watching school committee to actually see that we actually debate back and forth um, and we bring up different issues. That's why everybody here has a different expertise, and I wish that that had been captured, that we actually have that back and forth. And if you actually look back on our track record, many times we don't agree with each other, and we come to a place in the policy uh, of compromise, and we're always looking to see what is the benefit to the students and to the families. So I just want to say thank you for saying that. Um, I know there's much discussion, uh, and it's become um, more heated around the elected and appointed school committee. I know that if it was uh, elected, I would not be running for anything. I have no interest in being a politician, and I know many of my fellow members do not either. We don't aspire to go any higher. Um, and I remember um, when the school committee was elected and there was no representation of Latinos. So for me, um, you know, I think it's a discussion that's healthy and I'm okay with people having it, but I also want to say that for uh, the Latino community, it is you know, uh, problematic that we didn't have representation. And I do take it to heart um, that uh, I, I would just like people to know that we do, like you said, really take this seriously and that we really um, debate this and we take our time. And there's many more examples than the ones that you gave where we have moved things in a different direction because we've heard back from the community, because we've taken time to ask the question. So I just want to say thank you for uh, your words. Thank you, Vice Chair. There are no further comments. Uh, Mr. O'Neill. I, I will echo the Vice Chair's comments. Thank you for your comments, Mr. Chair. Um, I think they were needed. And um, there are many examples of how our policy votes have changed and our working with the superintendent has changed directly as a result of input we have heard from the community. And uh, we listen to it very seriously. So for example, there are many folks in the Jackson Mann community here this evening. And I, quite frankly, am looking forward to hearing your thoughts uh, when you talk to in public comments. That's how we learn that inputs uh, that impacts our feedback with the district and work to the district to when we get to a point that we actually vote on something. Uh, there are numerous examples from the past that um, the superintendent's original recommendation has changed because of input that we have received both here or when I'm in the coffee shop or when I'm in the school or walking down the street. I get stopped. I engage all the time. I was talking with uh, someone earlier today in a coffee shop. Um, so uh, I appreciate that you point that out. And um, thank you also, quite frankly, to the lesson that you gave tonight, Mr. Chair, in saying this publicly. Um, with three students from the Beethoven Orenberger here um, who were doing homework in the corner. But uh, what a lesson for them to learn um, when their dad says that publicly. So wow. um, mm -hmm. thank you. And I'm sorry for pointing that out publicly. Oh, well, don't, don't embarrass me. You know, they'll, uh, they'll, they'll get their revenge when we get home early. But they're working on their homework right now. So, um, But thank you, Mr. O'Neill. I appreciate that. Um, thank you, uh, Ms. Robinson. Um, if there's nothing further, I'll entertain a motion to approve the October 30th uh, meeting minutes as presented. So moved. I'm sorry, did I say meeting minutes? Um, Superintendent's yeah. report. Superintendent's report as presented. So moved. Thank you, uh, Mr. O'Neill. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, uh, Dr. Rivera. Is there any discussion or objections to the motion? Any objection to approving the uh, superintendent's report by unanimous consent? Well, thank you again. Uh, hearing none, the superintendent's report is approved. We want now to general public comment. Ms. Sullivan. Thank you, Mr. Lacanto. The public comment period is an opportunity for parents, students, and other concerned parties to make brief presentations to the school committee on pertinent school issues. Questions on specific school matters are not answered at this time, but are referred to the superintendent for later response. Questions on specific policy matters are not answered at this time, but may be the subject of later discussion by the committee. Each speaker will have three minutes to speak, and I will remind you when you have one minute remaining and then 30 seconds. Those who require interpretation services will receive an additional two minutes. Speakers may not reassign their time to others. Large groups addressing the same topic are encouraged to consolidate their remarks or choose a spokesperson to provide testimony. Written testimony is appreciated and encouraged. Any signage must not prohibit the participation of others. 
Please state your name and affiliation before you begin. TV cameras will only record speakers who face the committee. We have 12 speakers this evening, uh, and we'll begin with our student, <coughs> Anali, and she will be followed by Janina Seibel and Charlie Kim. Is Anali here? Welcome. Here she comes. Right over here. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Do you want to sit here beside me? Please. Good evening. Hola, mi nombre es Ana Lee. Voy a la Jackson Man. Este es mi cuarto año allí. The Jackson Man has been like a second home for me. This is my fourth year there. I didn't know nothing in first grade. In second grade, I learned English thanks to the Jackson Man. The Jackson Man is the best school for me, and it has helped me a lot all these years and I have had the best teachers all these years and I have made a lot of friends my friends are the best with me so we are like a big family we all live in Boston Austin all together I can't tell you exactly where I live, but I live <laughs> behind the school. <laughs> <laughs> I heard you are close, closing my school. If you close my school, it's like you're closing down my home, too. Muchas gracias por escucharme. Thank you, Anali. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Our next speaker, uh, we want a list to speak, ma'am? No? It's Bridget? Yeah. Yes. Buenas noches. Mi nombre es Blanca Enriquez, mamá de Anali. Good evening. My name is Blanca Enriquez. My, I'm the mother of Anali. Um, estoy aquí uh, en primer lugar en representación de, de mi hija. In the first place, the reason that I'm here is because I'm representing my daughter in the first place. Mm -hmm. Y también representando um, a la Jackson Man. And I'm also in representation of the uh, Jackson Man community here. Um, mi hija ha estado por cuatro años en la Jackson Man y ha aprendido mucho en lo que ha estado. Y como mm -hmm. madre, me siento orgullosa de I'm saber lo que ha aprendido. I'm very proud of my daughter because she's been studying at Jackson Man for four years. So as my mother, I'm very proud of everything she's been learning there. Um, también como madre y como estudiante porque yo he estado en la Jackson Man estudiando también. <coughs> as a mother and uh, I've been a, a student at the Jackson Man as well, so I'm speaking as a student as well. Yeah. Um, para mí es uh, para mí y para mí es una gran oportunidad que la Jackson Man esté presente, esté abierta, perdón, en Austin. It is a tremendous opportunity that the Jackson Man is open in Austin. Porque mi hija est estudia ahí y más que todo ella ha aprendido mucho. Lo que ha aprendido lo ha aprendido en la Jackson Man. Because me is my daughter, she studies there and what she's been learning, she had learned there at the Jackson Man. Uh, es gracioso, um, al principio <coughs> estuve en este lugar um, anotando a mi hija para que fuera a la Jackson Man. So it is very funny because uh, in the first place I was here before trying to uh, register for the Jackson Man. Ella um, uh, lloró porque no quería ir a la escuela, pero ahora me dice, mamá, valió la pena. She was crying at first because she didn't want to go to school, but now she told me it, it was worth it, ma'am, she said. 
me siento orgullosa de todo eso y saber lo que mi hija ha logrado estar en la Jackson Mac. So I'm very proud of all this I talked about and what she have achieved being a student at the Jackson Man. I'm very proud. Gracias a la Jackson Man y gracias a um, los maestros que han apoyado a mi hija, pues mi hija está donde está y por el por eso estoy acá y pido que por favor si se puede dar una oportunidad que la Jackson Man esté abierta. Thank you to Jackson Med School and the teachers that had allowed her to do what she's been doing and to be where she is right now. So I'm asking for an opportunity and a petition to have the school, the, the school open, to remain open. Para mí, para mi hija, la Jackson Med es como la segunda casa y la segunda familia. So Jackson Med, in my opinion, for my daughter is like my second or her second home and the second uh, family home as well. Muchas gracias. gracias. Thank you very much. <coughs> Thank you, Ms. Enriquez. <laughs> Next, we'll hear from Janina Seibel, followed by Charlie Kim and John Mudd. Hi. Good evening. It's very nice to have a face to the, to the name. That's awesome. My name is Janina. I have three kids in the Boston school system, uh, two at the Henderson and one at the Mather. I was about to testify because I had for months serious issues with the special ed office and how they address my daughter's needs. It seems like it's being addressed, seriously addressed at that point, so I'll write a written comment and I can give time to others. Thank you so much. Thank well, you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next we'll hear from Charlie Kim. He'll be followed by John Mudd and Caitlin Doherty. Good evening. Yes. Good evening. Um, I'm Charlie Kim from the Horace Mann School for the Deaf and Hard of Hearing. I'm a parent and also um, the site committee chair. Um, today I was going to speak briefly. Um, the principal uh, had asked if she can have uh, a couple words also thanking about today's great achievement. And as a former student, just in general, you can't say no to a principal. So <laughs> <laughs> if it's okay um, with the committee, I'd, um, she has few words and we'll stay within the time limit. Okay, please. Thank you. Thank you, Charlie, and thank you, a school committee. Um, this is a historical moment for our Horace Mann School for the Deaf and Hard of Hearing. Uh, much thought, hard work, and heart were invested to get to this point this evening. And I just want to thank you on behalf of our school community I want to thank all the departments in Boston Public Schools and in all the individuals who guided and supported our efforts to become who we have been and who we, are, we now are officially, a dual language program in American Sign Language and English. I want to thank you, Superintendent Casillas and school committee members for supporting our school, our school in these efforts. I also want to thank um, the Office of English Language Learners um, uh, uh, and its leader, uh, Priya Tah Tahiliani, um, our, our special education office, and Cindy Nielsen, and our many university partners, many of them are here. Um, from UMass Boston, Dr. Liana Pizzo, from Boston University, Dr. Na Naomi Campbell, and Dr. Amy Lieberman. Dr. Campbell is actually helping today, interpreting. Thank you so much. That's the kind of community that we have. Um, we are really supportive of one another, and I am so grateful. And also um, for uh, Northeastern University, Dr. Dennis Coakley, who is no longer with us, but I know he's smiling. Mm -hmm. He's very happy, I know that. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> and of course, I want to thank the Horseman community, our amazing teachers, staff, students, families, for de their dedication, determination, and commitment to working with all of us and our partners in defining and developing our dual language program. Our dual language program fosters bilingualism, biliteracy, enhanced awareness of cultural diversity, and high, level, high levels of academic achievement 
through the instruction of our school's academic languages, American Sign Language, and English. Thank you so much. Hi, my name is Dr. Michelle Eisensmith. As the first official deaf administrator in the history of Horace Mann School, I want to thank you so much for the opportunity to speak in front of you. I'm honored. We are proud of our foundation as a dual language program that really fosters a deaf-centric identity and bilingual learners. As a district, we're trailblazing in our efforts to set up a program office, a uh, program, op program option that benefits families who choose a dual language in ASL and English as their program. As we educate our future deaf and hard of hearing leaders, today's announcement is a giant step forward uh, to bring in alignment the, the offerings that we've had and, and the national recognition of, of best practices in deaf education. This is truly a historic moment and I look forward to the profound impact that this will have on deaf children, the, their families, and our community. So on behalf of our community, I want to thank you. Thank you again, Superintendent Casilius and members of the school committee. Um, today's announcement has highlighted the importance and uniqueness of the Horse Man School for the Deaf and Hard of Hearing, not only to BPS, but the surrounding communities of Boston. I want to respectfully remind everyone that the announcement of the Horace Mann infrastructure not being viable for as a long-term um, use was in April of this year. Um, to date, there has been no public guidance or clarity from BPS of the process to get it to an infrastructure plan for the Horace Mann. Um, what we are actually um, seeking is that clarity and the public acknowledgement from BPS for a need for a plan shouldn't drag into 2020. Superintendent Casilius and members of the school committee, please don't let our community down and let all the amazing work that amassed in the past 150 years just be history. The Horseman community wants to work with you to get to a meaningful infrastructure plan. The parents, the teachers, and the deaf community are already formally meeting and want to collaborate with you on this infrastructure plan. What we immediately need from you, Superintendent, is your leadership to effectively communicate to us that everything will be okay, that the building is a top priority, and that BPS will continue to support the Horace Mann School for the Deaf and Hard of Hearing for hopefully another 150 years plus. Thank you. Thank you all. Next we'll hear from Mr. John Mudd, followed by Caitlin Doherty and Stephanie Musali. Good evening, John Mudd, Advocate Emeritus. You know, I think this is my third meeting in a row in which I'm going to talk to you briefly about the achievement gap. Uh, I don't want to belabor the issue, but it is obviously a crucial issue for the entire system. It's a crucial goal for this committee and the superintendent. And there is important new data from the latest NAEP tests that I think need to be on the table before you go on your retreat next week. The 2019 national NAEP scores show the same trends as the Massachusetts MCAS results. Achievement gaps in the Boston public schools are increasing by almost every measure. For the last six years, for Latinos, from 2013 to 2019, the gaps with whites increased in fourth grade reading, fourth grade math, in eighth grade reading, and eighth grade math. The math, this increase of the gap was 17 points with an absolute gap of 51 points. For blacks in the same period, the gaps in achievement compared to whites increased in fourth grade reading and math and eighth grade math. Only in eighth grade reading was there a small decline in points. Thus, in seven of the eight measures, the gap went in the wrong direction. It increased. Not only do these gaps violate BPS's goals, but the absolute level of achievement for these students is also unacceptably low. As The Globe reported, Boston is also slipping in its relative rank compared to other big districts. 
We've talked about the goal of overcoming racial and ethnic and program achievement gaps among our students for years. With a new superintendent, we now have new hope and expectations to address these challenges with the urgency that they demand. From past efforts, it seems clear that one size, one strategy, one curriculum, one style of teaching, one type of teacher does not fit all, and the gaps increase. We accept the need for differentiated instruction and learning for students with disabilities, but we need targeted strategies to engage and support different communities of blacks, different targeted languages and curricula to engage different Latino and EL cultures. As you know, with my work on the EL task force, I've tried to highlight the needs of English learners with disabilities, the lowest performing group in this district, for seconds. access to native language and instruction and support services. To make progress, we can all look forward to seeing the superintendent's strategic plan. We have hope. We are ready and want to support new directions. We need to see and feel this new leadership, both from the superintendent and from the school committee, to address these longstanding achievement and student performance issues with the skill and forthrightness that they deserve. <coughs> Thank you for hearing me. Thank you, Mr. Mudd. Our next speaker is Caitlin Doherty, and she'll be followed by Stephanie Musali and Moreland Durestan Hosa. Good evening. My name is Caitlin Doherty, and I'm a K Zero K One teacher at the Higginson Inclusion School. I am here tonight to ask that our new playground be dedicated to our principal, Marie Mullen, who is retiring next week. First, I would like to thank Superintendent Caselius, Chairman Chairman Mr. Lacanto. I'm Mayor Marty Walsh and the other people from the city and district who were at our ribbon cutting ceremony yesterday. Marie Mullen is a thoughtful and caring leader who inspires her staff to do their best, has remained a teacher in her outlook and mindset, which enables her to put teaching and learning first. She encourages all teachers to serve on school committees and then guides and empowers those committees to shape school culture and design and refine school practices always acknowledges and attributes the success of the Higginson School to the staff and never gives herself credit, is always willing to make unconventional decisions if it will likely result in student success, academic, social, and emotional. She puts forth great effort to know the students of the Higginson School as well as their families, respects rules and policies, formed and nurtured critical partnerships with community-based organizations in order to meet our students' needs, she worked tirelessly to get a playground funded for the school and facilitated the entire process. And she goes above and beyond the traditional principal role in meeting the needs of students, families, and staff by baking cookies, organizing Thanksgiving dinners, and Christmas gifts. Thank you for your consideration of dedicating our school's playground to our principal, Marie Mullen. We will be working with our super elementary superintendent, Anna Tavares, to follow the correct protocols to have the playground dedicated in her name. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Doherty. Thank you for noting that as well. You know, I, me I meant to mention uh, during the superintendent's remarks earlier that we look forward to uh, on the 20th, hopefully, uh, taking a vote uh, as soon as uh, we have a, a positive uh, uh, vote from the uh, school council. Thank you very much. Ms. Uh, Selvin. Thank you. Our next speaker is Stephanie Musali, followed by Moreland Duresantosa and Madeline Doherty. Uh, good evening, my name is Stephanie Musali. I'm a third grade teacher at the Jackson Mann School, here to speak to you on behalf of my students and colleagues. Uh, last year, we were informed that there were some major changes in store for our building. We know, probably better than anyone, that our building is in disrepair. However, our community is not. Our community, as you can see, is still very much intact, and we need answers now. It has been roughly eight months since we got news that our future is uncertain, and still we have absolutely no specific answers about the months and years to come. As you know, the Jackson Man has the only advanced work program in Alston Brighton. It also houses an enormous ABA and inclusion strand and many ELL students whose families are just starting out in this country. For these students and all students, change matters. Consistency and preparation are key to a healthy transition. To keep these families guessing for any longer seems like a disservice from our city to its most vulnerable residents. 
We need to start preparing these kids for the changes to come. We're here today to ask for complete transparency. If there is no plan yet, we have so many valuable assets, able and willing to help create one that works. But we deserve to know and we deserve to know now. We ask that any and all discussions about the future of our community are shared without ambiguity now. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Morlin Duresens Hosa, followed by Madeline Doherty and Floridima. Good evening. Hi. My name is Morlin Dorestant Joseph. I'm a general education grade two teacher at the Jackson Man. I've been at the Jackson Man for 18 years and I've had the privilege of working with my beloved students, <coughs> families, colleagues in a community that is like home to me. Like many of the other members of our community, I've come tonight to ask for transparency and clarity. Is there a policy to phase out the Jackson Man School by under-enrolling it. This issue has impacted our students, our families, our teaching, and our learning during this current school year. In the past few years, we have steadily seen the numbers of students enrolled in our school dwindle. This became a glaring issue. In September, we marked our lowest enrollment in the last 10 years. Several parents informed us that their younger children had been waitlisted or flat out denied the choice of enrolling at the Jackson Man. Several parents have even asked us about why kindergarten students are not being allowed to attend our school, while several classes have less than half the number of students than we normally have. District Ride, we know there are currently long wait lists for K0, K1 classrooms. We currently have over 26 open seats in K0, K1 at the Jackson Man, and dozens of early elementary classrooms that are under-enrolled. Why were these students turned away in September, but they're still being turned away now? Are they only to be put on wait lists? We can provide several examples of younger siblings of general ed and inclusion students who were denied access to K0, K1 seats at the Jackson Man, while staff in classrooms are ready and waiting to receive them. Also this year, we've seen our SEI and immigrant student populations continue to grow. And we would hope that there would be equity with all the populations being allowed to enroll at our school. How are the possible changes being communicated with all families? We are, we are willing and able to work with the district and we want to serve our families. We need clarity and transparency for th all of the families that we serve. Thank you for having us come tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Madeline Doherty. She'll be followed by Flori Dima and Megan Wolf. Hello, my name is Madeline Doherty. I'm an early childhood educator in the ABA strand at the Jackson Man. My students are between the ages of three and five years old, most of whom are diagnosed with autism. The Jackson Man includes nine of these substantially separate classrooms for students from K-0 to eighth grade. The ABA strand works hard to impl implement creative and authentic opportunities for the inclusion of all of our students. As you have heard, the Jackson Man provides access to so many different classroom settings under one roof. Parents value this model because it allows students to take risks in a safe and familiar learning environment. My class, for example, participates in the Breakfast Club. Children from the general education, inclusion, and ABA settings, many of whom are also English language learners, are able to come together to play, eat breakfast, and just to be kids. We have also had a student come to our school with a substantially separate placement in the ABA strand who because of our K-8 to model and because of the strength of our inclusive community was able to transition out of the sub-separate classroom 
to inclusion and ultimately to an advanced work placement. What is your plan to ensure that all students continue to have access to the least restrictive environment with the least amount of disruption to their services and without taking them out of their current school community? Many of our students will stay with us from age three to 13. Continuity of services is essential to preventing any regression in skills. These are our most vulnerable students and any change is more disruptive than you can imagine. If there are going to be changes, our families and staff need to be a part of the conversation. We need transparency. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Flori Dima. She'll be followed by Megan Wolf and Peggy Wiesenberg. Ms. Dima. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Megan Wolf. Figure we move on. Good evening. My name is Megan Wolf. I'm a former Boston Public Schools parent and a member of uh, the Grassroots Parent Group Quest, which is dedicated to quality, <laughs> equity, and transparency in the BPS. I'd like to go back in time for a minute to the spring of 2018, 18 months ago. I want to recall three school committee meetings when the Dever McCormick fields were discussed. I know some of you were in the room for these discussions, but I know others weren't. My hope is that recalling these conversations might inform future decisions about the field. April 11th, 2018 is the first time that the fields of De Deborah McCormick were discussed here at school committee. A number of you were quick to defend community interests, asking Makiba McCreary from the BPS and Sheila Dillon of the Department of Neighborhood Service Development about the school's opinion of the proposal. Notably, Ms. McCreary said she didn't know if the schools had yet been informed, and she joked, they know now. Superintendent Tommy Chang promised a letter to the school communities by the next day, which sadly did not arrive. Your concerns about community input were somewhat heated, though, and by the time of the next school committee meeting in May, it was announced that the district could retain control of the land until an acceptable proposal was received one which took into account the community's desires regarding the land. The final resolution to is issue an RFP was up for a vote at the next meeting. By then, the district and the city in included notable language highlighting your commitment to community control. <coughs> it stipulated that the land should benefit students and the BPS and DND would actively seek student community output, input and involvement to inform the drafting of the RFP. School committee members had admirably advocated for community voice, and Mr. Lacanto, Superintendent Chang, and Mr. Consalvo, then Chief of Staff, all clearly understood and acquiesced to these concerns. And yet, despite that, the fact that students, educators, and community members had expressed deep concerns about development, and despite clear stipulations in the resolution to include them in the development of the RFP, there was no involvement of the McCormick in the in community in these discussions. I don't know where the school committee goes from here. I imagine many of you are disturbed at the process and at the lack of attention to the voices of the community and the lack of attention to your own concerns and resolution. 30 seconds. I can tell you that many of us who follow the process are also deeply disturbed. It raises serious questions about the ways in which the district and school committee monitors and enforces it its own resolutions. It raises questions about the forces that have long been determined to development develop this land, especially because as early as May 2018, we've heard that it was destined to be developed by the Boys and Girls Club, which turned out to be the sole respondent to the RFP. It also raises questions about other parcels of land in BPS, including West Roxbury campus, where as recently as last week, the police academy, long rumored to be the recipients of this parcel, were already performing exercises. And finally, it raises questions about the intent and transparency of Build BPS a plan that would allow one-off developments of a parcel of land without any coherent and long-term plan or community input. If the BPS, city, and school committee can't live up to the promise of a simple school committee resolution, we are forced to ask, how can the body protect the vital interests of students and schools? I hope that you'll be able to take these prior events and conversations into account when you're asked to vote on the, vote on the Boys and Girls Club proposal. 
If you'd like to review the conversations the committee has already had, a collection of clips and links to the full conversations are available on the Quest website at questparents.org. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. Our next speaker is Peggy Wiesenberg. Good evening. Good evening. I'm here to testify also about transparency and about the um, McCormick. I am here to urge you to cancel RFP 10. 95 and or reject the proposal submitted by the Boys and Girls Club of Dorchester. The RFP was flawed and contrary to the resolution of this body that Megan Wolf just spoke about. It is not in the best interest of the city or the BPS to proceed when it does not advance what students, teachers, parents, and community have repeatedly told you they want preservation of open space and improvement to the McCormick outdoor athletic field. The timing of the publication of the RFP June 25th after school let out is suspect, especially considering that the RFP yielded a sole bidder that's been looking to build an indoor sports complex, something like the Reggie Lewis Center in Dorchester for four years and jumped on the opportunity when they learned the McCormick School was slated for closure. It is not in the best interest of the city to risk even the appearance of a conflict of interest, especially given the mayor's new equity requirements for public land being put out to bid. And the fact that the executive vice president of the sole bidder has made campaign contributions to Mayor Walsh over the years and as recently as May 31st, 2019 when the RFP was in play. It would be far better to work with Dorchester's Ryan T. Woods, the Commissioner of Parks and Recreation, the former Parks and Recreation Commissioner Chris Cook, um, who last year joined the cabinet as the chief of environment, energy, and open space, and Christine Poff, the city's uh, community preservation director to preserve and upgrade the open space consistent with the Community Preservation Act that Boston voters approved in November by voting, November 2016, by voting yes on ballot question five. It would be far better to develop policies for the BPS-owned land and financing for Build BPS before taking the unprecedented step of giving away BPS-owned property to a private developer via a 30 or 100-year ground lease. What projects are to be financed through the city's capital budget, through the MSBA, or through the ground lease? And what about adopting a policy about P3s, private-public private partnerships? It's one thing to accept money from the Gates Foundation for breaking up comprehensive high schools into small schools, but it's a totally different kind of private-public partnership to lease a BPS building to a charter management company for a privately run charter school or BPS land to a private partner like the Boys and Girls Club that has three sites and wants to, to expand to build a fourth clubhouse. Ms. Wiesenberg, I'm afraid you've lost um, your time. My time's up. I've written, excuse the typos. Comments. I typed this out knowing that I might be cut off. But I hope you look at some of the footnotes and the information about we other will, parcels and the city's capital budget and Thank how you. we're planning for other uh, fields in the city. Thank, Thank you for you. your comments, Ms. Wiesenberg. Thank you. Mr. LaConta, that concludes our public comment. All right, thank you very much, uh, Ms. Sullivan. And thank you again to the uh, Jackson Man community. I know there were a number of you that uh, wanted to speak tonight, and I appreciate you consolidating your comments, but also speaking um, very, uh, very much from the heart. And, um, you know, we, we understand your issue here. As I, as I had a chance to speak to you quickly before this meeting, um, it's been six years that we've been trying to work on uh, this uh, process. And, you know, certainly um, 
I, I can understand your uh, your need to, to have some um, clarity with which uh, uh, what's going to happen with your school. And, um, you know, we feel that and we want that for all across this district. We have a new superintendent on board and we're certainly trying to get her up to speed and get our plans clarified for not only your school, but each and every one of the 125 schools across our district. So we thank you for bearing with us. We, s we certainly will make sure that we continue to work with you. And please, Superintendent. So to the Jackson Man community and the Horace Man community, uh, I just indulge your patience a little bit. I just got here. <laughs> and so uh, you've probably read in the papers that I was pausing Build PPS, you know, certainly not the shovel ready or promises that have already been made. I'm just trying to understand and get into all the schools in terms of the prioritization of those. I've been in the Jackson Man. There is urgency to this. Um, I'm finishing up my tour in the next couple weeks. I'll be out there. And I just want to say publicly, anytime teachers want to talk to me, you don't have to come to a school committee to talk to me. Just request a meeting with me. I'd be glad to come and talk to teachers about any, any matter, um, as well as community members as well. So I, I do want you to come and talk to the school committee um, if you disagree with recommendations that I make and that sort of thing. But um, I just want the opportunity to be able to be transparent and to engage with you authentically. And I hope I've demonstrated that with the 86 or so meetings that I've had over the past three months. So just give me a little time here. Uh, I'll be out as, as soon as I can. I know the matters are very urgent at the Jackson Man, as uh, Chair uh, or Member O'Neill has uh, talked about as well. So thank you. Well, thank you for saying that, Superintendent. Mm. Thank you again. I know you have school tomorrow. <laughs> All right, uh, we'll move on now. Our first action item this evening is grants for approval totaling $335,000. I'll open up now to questions and comments from the committee. Yep, the yes, Ms. Robinson. Let me just find my notes quickly. Um, yes, I was interested in the, um, the mass grab promising practice grant process. So these, these three would be, I guess, now a total of five that we have um, approved. And my question really is more about process. Um, now that there are five of these in the district, is there any kind of collaboration amongst them as they've each chosen their own sort of projects to focus on? And so my question is, I'm not sure if this is one-time grant money. You know, are they choosing things that will continuously depend on additional funds to continue in subsequent years or are they trying to find processes that um, they can practice but then continue? And I saw one school was doing something unique with, you know, using their money for an <coughs> evening school for kids, but each of them have a wide variety of activities and questions are, you know, how are we looking at what's really being effective in this realm and what will be able to be continued without additional funds or could be shared with other schools who are having considerably, you know, having the same problems. Yeah, Ms. Um, Robinson, we are, um, these are the schools that have uh, graduation rates lower rates. than 67%. Right. Mm -hmm. I've actually, that's for all students within the school that the state provides that, um, but we are also looking at any student group below that mm -hmm. um, that has a graduation rate under 67%, and the high school superintendents are working with the principals now on high school redesign, and all of that will be tied together as they work together to address these really complex issues on why students aren't graduating and what the specific nature is in terms of the specific student groups and what we can do together um, around promising practices. So I, I believe that some of the work will be done individually and some of the innovative work in individual schools based on their unique populations, mm -hmm. but there will be also work done um, district-wide with our high schools. So I think it's a both and, and I know um, we'll have some additional comments yeah, here. Yeah, and I just want to... I just wanted to add that we do have a total of eight schools that have been awarded this grant, so mm -hmm. we will have a few more coming okay. in at the next school committee meeting. We were just waiting for all the schools to submit their proposals. So they do all have, at this point, distinct proposals around how they're using the money. Mm -hmm. So it's like almost a third of our high schools. Yep. If we It'll have eight, yeah. Mm. There, there, it, it's going to be more than that when we look at student groups as well. They may not get the money um, because the state's awarding it by 67% for an all group but we'll be doing work to address all of our student groups underneath that, okay. um, which is probably unique in Massachusetts that we're focusing not only just on the all student group, but it's the demographic groups underneath that as well. Focus support. Yes. Yeah. 
Thank, thank you. you. Uh, thank you, Ms. And that's Robinson. tied into our attendance work as well. Yeah. You know, because obviously graduation and chronic attendance, all of that uh, matters. And then the mass core and setting expectation and. I want to recognize that Headmaster uh, King from Binka as well as Headmaster Murphy from uh, the English are both here, and, and those are two of the three schools that will be receiving this grant uh, if approved this evening. Is there any representative from the McKinley? Hello. Welcome. <laughs> um, and so uh, it's nice to have all three schools out this evening to uh, speak to um, uh, further practices if needed. Uh, Ms. Al uh, Vice Chair Alva Davila. Yeah, thank you. Um, I just had a quick comment. Um, <coughs> Uh, looking at the STARS grant, um, I know the process is that schools apply and that this is an umbrella piece. Mm -hmm. um, so I know you just got here, so I'm totally giving you time. Um, <laughs> but uh, I want to make sure as we move forward again, I said this I think at the last meeting, that we do look at this in an mm -hmm. equitable way That's of right. who is applying because I'm sure if you have less resources, you're not out there trying to get a grant and other schools may have more resources. Um, and then the other thing is, just as a practice, I, I repeat, I think what um, Dr. Hardin said last time is, um, for the long term, mm -hmm. I really do want to see the grants, especially mm -hmm. ones that are repeating, is what are the outcomes that we can look at at the end of the year to see if, if they've really moved. So, We actually had this uh, conversation just when we were reviewing these grants and talking about that. And I think that some of this will res be resolved, and we'll talk a little bit more about resource allocation and one of the emerging themes mm -hmm. coming up in strategic planning uh, next week at the retreat. And we'll talk a little bit more in depth about grants, contracts, fundraising, um, and how those decisions are made. Excellent. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you, Vice Chair. Mr. O'Neill. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. I just have to call out, since we have Headmaster King here from Binker, I um, was interested in the goals that are being set, uh, particularly talking about um, on the survey questions of how how students feel connected to Binka. And I'm actually surprised the goals are as low as they are only because the Binka students I meet are always so connected to the school. And uh, Headmaster King, no, you don't have to come up. I just wanted to call it out because, you know, attending your uh, speech competition every year, the students, you know, a few years ago we're talking about they want a soccer field and they want better food and now they're so much more involved about bullying issues at the school. Uh, bullying issues in high school and how to improve that and uh, sex ed training and a whole bunch of other issues. They're some of the most engaged students I've met in the district. And so I was surprised. I think you could set the goals even a little bit higher because I wouldn't be surprised if you get to the 90% of students being engaged with Benka. So I just want to call out the great work that you're doing there. Um, and uh, that's the only comment I wanted to make, sorry. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you again, Mr. O'Neill, and thank you again for highlighting, as always, the good work that's uh, happening in schools across our, our uh, district. Um, the no further questions are in our, I'll entertain a motion to approve the grants as presented. Is there a second? Second. Uh, thank you, uh, Vice Chair and uh, Mr. O'Neill. Any discussion or objection to the motion? Any objection to approving the motion by unanimous consent? Hearing none, the grants are approved. Thank you and good luck. Uh, our next ac uh, action item is the appointment of three new uh, members of the committee's English Language Learners Task Force. And you recall at our last meeting, ELL Task Force co-chair Dr. Lorna Rivera uh, nominated Angelina Camacho, uh, Fabian Torres Ardila, and Roseanne Tung to replace several members who will be stepping off the task force. All of the nominees are immensely qualified and received enthusiastic support from my fellow committee members uh, last week. Uh, I'll now open up to uh, any further comments or questions from the committee. Great team. Great people. Great team. Yeah. Well, just to summarize again, thank you, uh, Dr. Uh, Rivera and your uh, colleagues for going out and uh, recruiting these individuals. Uh, each of them has uh, a very long um, legacy with the district, uh, either as students or as teachers or as partners, uh, as parents, uh, and you know, service on a number of our different committees. Uh, over time, so I think they'll they'll be a great addition to your task force and continue doing the good work that you're doing. So, uh, if there's nothing further, I'll entertain a motion to approve the appointment of Ms. Camacho, Dr. Torres Ardala, and Dr. Tung as presented. So moved. Thank you, uh, Ms. Robinson. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Mr. O'Neill. Is there any discussion or objection? Uh, Ms. Uh, Sullivan, will you please call the roll? Mr. O'Neill. Yes. Dr. Rivera. Yes. Ms. Robinson. Yes. Ms. Oliver Davila. 
Mr. Lacanto. Yes. The motion passes unanimously. Thank you, Ms. Sullivan. We'll move on now to our next, uh, uh, excuse me, our final action item, uh, which is the appointment of Marinelle Ruzman, uh, Ruminaire, uh to serve as the co-chair of the School Quality Working Group Part 2. Uh, you will recall that at our last meeting, Dean Hard uh, Dr. Harden Coleman, uh, who uh, co-chairs the co School Quality Working Group uh, currently and uh, couldn't uh, join us this evening because he's traveling, uh, made this proposal to the committee. Uh, Ms. Ruminaire has been a long-term uh, member of the, the committee and has served, as, uh, served on a number of other uh, committees uh, all across the district and is the current CEO of Edvestors, which is a valued uh, partner of the district. And so we're very happy to have her uh, aboard, uh, uh, potentially. <coughs> Excuse me. So um, in his absence, uh, I'll remind the committee that uh, Ms. Ruminaire um, has been uh, a valued partner, has been uh, serving um, in a number of capacities, and uh, will be a uh, great addition in uh, a leadership role on uh, the SQF working group. So if there are no further questions, any comments? I'll entertain a motion to... Thank, uh, thank you to our willingness to serve. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. O'Neill, indeed. Uh, I'll entertain a motion now to approve the appointment as, of uh, Ms. Ruminer as the co-chair of the School Quality Working Group as presented. Thank you, uh, Vice Chair. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Mr. O'Neill. Any discussion or objection? Ms. Sullivan, will you please call the roll? Mr. O'Neill? Yes. Dr. Rivera? Yes. Ms. Robinson? Yes. Ms. Oliver Davila? Yes. Mr. Lacanto? Yes. The motion passes unanimously. Well, thank you, uh, Ms. Sullivan, once again. And uh, congratulations and thank you once again to all of uh, our community members that are stepping up and serving on our uh, task forces to. Um, each of the, the four individuals that we've nominated and uh, confirmed tonight, as well as the many other uh, that serve on all of our task forces. Okay, uh, we'll move on now. We have three reports this evening. Um, each of them are uh, fairly short in length, um, but two of them have been have come at the request of the committee. Those are the first two that we'll hear from this evening. Uh, our first report is a field trip policy proposal that relates to uh, international travel. Um, in the district. And so at this time, I'd like to invite our Director of Global Education, Kayla Dorsey Chumasi, please let me know if I um, pronounce your name correctly, to please step forward with your presentation. And I should met, note for uh, members in the audience, I believe we're having some technical difficulties with the overhead uh, screen and the projector this evening. So we won't be able to project uh, these brief presentations above, but as I mentioned earlier, and as uh, many of our frequent uh, uh, attendees know there are uh, printed copies of each of these handouts in the hallway for your use. Ms. Chumasi. Good evening. My name is Kayla Dorsey Chumasi. I'm the Director of Global Education housed in the Office of Academics and Professional Learning. This evening I have two requests for the committee. The first is the approval of the field trip policy which will allow my department to systematically ensure safe, equitable, and inclusive field trip programming practices throughout the district. The second request is to change the international field trip approval process, whereby the school committee approval will no longer be required. Currently, BPS does not have a field trip policy. We presently rely on circulars that were last approved by the school committee in 2011. Approval of this policy would include a definition of what actually constitutes a BPS field trip. It also uh, gives advice as to student conduct and field trip conduct and behavior in the field on field trip participation. It requires an assessment of field trip risk via review of itineraries. It also calls for district field and overall general district safety procedures and communication plans. It also calls for a review of our insurance coverage and policies to determine whether or not they are effective annually or if we need a different insurance coverage or providers. It also allows for the revision and or addition of field trip specific circulars as needed. I'm very proud to say that this proposal is grounded in equity, access, and inclusion. Schools are reminded to make every possible effort <coughs> to make these field trip experiences affordable for all students, especially those instructional field trips. 
it reaffirms that English learners, students who have 504 plans or who are on IEPs cannot be denied access to field trip experiences. In fact, schools shall establish essential participation criteria, which will determine what modifications or accommodations are needed so that students can successfully and safely participate in either all aspects of the field trip or portions of the field trip experience. Regarding inclusion, which is extremely important, schools shall consider the student demographics uh, when selecting field trip sites, locations, and activities, and especially the impact that these experiences may have on our students, specifically students of color, our immigrant students, as well as our students who identify with the LGBT community, and really preparing those students for any sensitive experiences that they may encounter while on the field trip. Schools shall also consider accommodations, specifically rooming and name preference for our transgender and gender nonconforming youth. For our second request, we are asking that uh, the school committee is no longer required to approve international field trips. Instead, applications will be routed directly through my office where they will be thoroughly vetted. However, principal and headmaster uh, approval is still required, as well as the signature of our superintendent, Dr. Caselius, the superintendent of that specific school, and the CFO. In the spirit of transparency, as well as continuous improvement and really trying to get better at this work, my department will make uh, monthly written reports to the school committee that outlines international trips that we're taking in the previous month, as well as report annually uh, on issues of equity and making equitable opportunities for both students and schools, as well as any major travel initiatives, uh, any international trips that were taken, as well as the associated demographic data for those international trips to really review any trends or patterns in the data that we're seeing and how they can be addressed, as well as any incidents that may call for policy changes. So in closing, I would like to request that the school committee really consider approving the field trip policy as broadly outlined this evening, as well as making the change to the international field trip application process. And I would like to note that there are very specific guidelines uh, that correspond to each type of field trip, day, overnight, international, homestay, as well as water activities that are uh, thoroughly outlined in each of the superintendent circulars. Thank you. Well, thank you, Ms. Dorsey uh, Chimezi. And um, I appreciate you uh, putting together uh, a very brief presentation that summarizes a lot of information that you've uh, just uh, mentioned there, uh, pulling in from a lot of different sources um, and covering a, a very um, vast and broad um, effort that we have uh, <coughs> across our district, both for uh, day trips as well as um, uh, international and, and other trips that require a plane, not just a bus. Um, so um, thank you. I want to open it up to my members for, uh, my fellow members for questions and discussion. Vice Chair, you want to start it off? Um, I, uh, I'm just curious about the, uh, the equity piece and um, the statement that schools shall make every reasonable effort to make instructional field trips affordable. Um, can you talk a little bit more about that? And I'm wondering if that can also be part of the policy just uh, more uh, with greater explanation. I don't really know what that means. Um, and is there a way, um, Superintendent, in the future, mm -hmm. when we look at some of the funding that's coming in, if there's a pocket of money we can put on the side so that anytime a student wants to take a field trip, this, is, this doesn't have to be a hindrance? Yes, definitely. That's the goal. Uh, I would like to say, first and foremost, that there's a lot of schools out there that are doing some amazing work in terms of fundraising and making these experiences a reality for our students. Teachers are working extremely hard. 
we just want to remind schools that um, we are encouraging them to make these experiences as affordable mm -hmm. as possible, especially when they're connected to the curriculum, instruction, and will enhance the learning that takes place in the classroom. I know in my first year here in this role, uh, one of my strategic priorities is to develop funding opportunities. So if a school is having difficulty supporting students, that they can contact my department directly and I would have a pool of money, a reserve made available to provide scholarships for students to access these opportunities. That would be great. And um, is there a process so when a field trip comes out and a student sees an application, does it say on the application, you know, should you need a scholarship, you know, like check this? So there's something that denotes to the student that they actually can get a scholarship or support. Currently, that there is not, but that is a great recommendation. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Sorry, you yes, there should be notice to the families on how to access that. Mm -hmm. And um, also, one of these pieces is that I requested was about this reasonableness of the of the opportunity for students, especially when it's instructional. Um, sometimes there's optional trips, senior trips that kids take that are, you know, more optional types of uh, experiences. Mm -hmm. And we'd love for all of our kids to do that. But when it's actually tied to their instruction, to their curriculum, to their learning, to a standard, that needs to be provided, and we need to provide that for our students. And so, uh, in the future, um, we will have as part of our um, fundraising and and uh, allocation funding for students to have scholarships for these types of experiences that are tied to their educational program. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Oliver Dabla. Uh, Ms. Robinson. Yes. Yes, thank you very much for your work. I recognize that, particularly the, the international field trips, et cetera, are things that our older students have an opportunity to access. So I'm looking at w what is the overall plans around field trips starting with pre-K? on up in terms of the whole idea of using the city, um, getting people into that mode that you can learn mm -hmm. out and about, and we are in a city with incredible resources. And, uh, and how are we helping our schools or classrooms you know, to make sure that from the very okay. beginning um, we are providing opportunities for our students at all grade levels to get, a, get out and about in our city before they're transported to go across halfway across the world do our kids know Boston? Right. Um, and I think about that, particularly now that all of our s students in grade seven and above have T cards. Mm -hmm. So, you know, what are we doing that's helping mm -hmm. schools think about field experiences differently given these opportunities? Yes. Yeah. Definitely. That's a great point. As we know, Boston has a wealth of resources, it, it is essentially a classroom, especially for the humanities and, and literature fields. Uh, my office is working to um, really promote utilizing uh, the city as a classroom and consulting with teachers on how they can make that a reality. Um, I think what, al what also is important is partnering with different organizations, museums, mm -hmm. um, you know, local community partnerships, I think is extremely important in, in accessing and tapping those resources. So that is something that my office is committed to working on. And in the regard of international uh, field trips, we actually have middle schools participating in trips as well. So we're expanding our reach in that area. Mm -hmm. But even, even so with all of that, only a very small fraction of our students have really the, that opportunity. So the question is, if we're using the city, mm -hmm. every student can have access right. um, to that. So, and it would be wonderful if we could get to the point where in every grade there was a given field trip so that every four-year-old. My big issue is could every four-year-old go and ride the swan boats? It's the only place in the country you can do it. And they read the book. <laughs> and, they read the book. <laughs> and they read the book. So if we could start with our youngest children really making field experiences a, a real part of life in the city and their experience. Definitely. Thank you. Mm -hmm. and, um, and um, Ms. Robinson, I think that it's also part of the academic curriculum. Yes. Mm -hmm. And so I know Andrea Zayas is here, and as they begin mm -hmm. to look at the curricular frameworks and the opportunities, sure. that's another opportunity to be able to look at how do we use Boston, our own backyard, yes. as a learning mm -hmm. uh, tool for our students as early as pre-K. And what yes. are the things that we should expect them that they have done with their families before 
even mm-hmm. going to kindergarten. And I think that um, there's opportunities because so many of our museums offer free days mm-hmm. and many of our families don't know about it. So what can we do, do in more. terms of promotional materials through the curriculum? And so mm-hmm. uh, it's, it's, yeah. we're excited about this new policy and what it might be able to mm-hmm. uh, bring to equity. So thank you so much for your leadership, Kayla, on developing it. Mm-hmm. Thank you, Ms. Robinson, Mr. O'Neill. Yes, um, so thank you for this work. This is, this is really cool. You've put a lot of work into this, particularly you've now developed about homestay programs and water activities. Um, you have adjusted the uh, procedures for all field trips and for international. I've been a huge supporter of particularly international travel for our students. Um, I'm going to be reading through these guidelines in person. Thank you for adding in a weekly, uh, excuse me, a monthly report for school committee because we do like to know where our students are traveling internationally, but I appreciate how you're trying to streamline the process and the impact that will make for our school leaders in particular. Um, getting back to the point that Ms. Robinson said, so the head of social studies, I believe, has put together a great website for the social study teachers where they can actually see She's right over what? there. Oh, mm-hmm. Miss Scott. Mm-hmm. Oh, there she is, Miss Scott. Right, that great work you've done on the website for the school leaders to see what uh, uh, what museums are offering free admission or reduced admission. We have to figure out how to make that more available. Matter of fact, we may want to get a version of that on BSACs uh, that the students can actually mm-hmm. access it as well. Mm-hmm. But you know, Dr. Granson and I believe Dr. Rose and I were on the Constitution, and we ended up in. You were there, right, Dr. Rose? Were you there that day? No. I'm so, oh, I'm sorry. No, Put your glasses on. Yeah, yeah, put my contacts on. I apologize. <laughs> Dr. Granson and I were, were there, um, and we were talking about this very issue of how we get more of our students to see the whole city. Mm-hmm. And so, Superintendent, I would almost challenge you to think of it in terms of uh, three circles. So one is the city as a classroom, mm-hmm. and how do we get more of our students to get out and about to the Old North Church, to the Constitution to I'm sorry the Latin Quarter to the Latin Quarter to um, the museums that are across the city many of which are dying to have our students come mm-hmm. in and visit so how do we get them to see the city as a classroom the second intersecting circle would almost be how do we get people to view nature as a classroom mm-hmm. so the Appalachian Mountain Club does great things with a bunch of our yes. students uh, Outward Bound does great things between the two of them Thompson Island and, Thompson Thompson, Island. That's Outward Bound, yeah, Thompson Island. I know you've actually been out there. And I, I was recently in conversations with the heads of both of those organizations who actually them. don't intersect Zoom. much. Mm-hmm. Superintendent, I recently talked to the heads of both of those organizations who actually don't talk much, but they're willing to sit down and figure out how to have a combined solution mm-hmm. for BPS of how every, every one of our students can have an outdoor experience to learn. So if we think of nature as a classroom. Mm-hmm. And then the last is what you're already doing with the international trips. The last circle to me is the world as a classroom. So how do we get students to see our city more? How do we get them to experience outdoor nature more? And then ultimately, how do we get them in middle school and high school to travel? and see that the world, it's a global economy. And you know, the more they learn that, the more they learn the, um, how they can succeed in, in uh, this, globe, this global, th- the world that we're in right now. And um, the last point I want to point out is on the international circular, this committee has made a big deal the past few years of really encouraging trips not just to be, oh, the school's going to Paris, and you're going to see the Louvre, and you're going to see the Museum d'Orsay, and you're going to see the Eiffel Tower, and you're going to see the Arc de Triomphe, but how are you really learning what's going on in that city? What experiences are you having, be it homestay or visiting schools or going off the beaten track, so to speak? We have really strongly encouraged that to happen. Is there a way you have built that into a circular that you know, those types of trips and learning experiences more encouraged than just hitting the typical tourist sites? Yes, so in the new application, I'm actually asking for the standard alignment of of the trip. So how does it connect directly to the curriculum? What are the learning outcomes that we can expect uh, students to receive as a result of their participation? So I'm looking very critically at the itineraries, consulting with teachers directly to find out what the purpose and the objective, and the objectives are of the program. Um, I'm actually hosting, um, in collaboration with Envoys this Saturday, a program design workshop where it encourages teachers to think intentionally about field trips as 
and really moving away from calling them a trip, but a program, a program that includes a pre-departure component, an infield learning experience, and then a post uh, a post program reflection piece about the learning and how it can be applied. Um, so I think through those efforts, we'll be moving more towards intentionality uh, in regards to field programs or experiential programs as opposed to just a trip. Excellent. I, Thank you. Um, Mr. O'Neill, I think there's also opportunities for service learning mm -hmm. oh, yeah. opportunities, yeah. Uh, not only here in Boston, but across the globe and across the nation. Which we've actually seen um, a big increase in our students the past couple of years. And it, it, students love doing those projects because they want to solve big problems. Yep. Um, so, you know, you don't just go over to Paris, you might go over to Paris and understand the climate compact, mm. for instance, and be part of a political solution or um, study abroad where there's exchanges with families and their cultural exchanges um, or field studies where you're going to a conservatory or an arboretum and working on insects and um, preservation yep. um, pieces. So I think that when you can tie those into the curriculum, that's why I brought up um, Ms. Zayas because I think she's going to be able to work with the teachers and the students on these really um, amazing opportunities for children in the future. So Love this it. just broadens and opens the, the conversation. Love there's it. also the opportunity now, there's some really cool software around virtual mm. field trips. Um, and so you can bring in those little oculars or whatever they call <laughs> them. <laughs> yeah, Virtual and you can go and yeah. you can go to the Louvre and you can just look yeah. up and down and look around. I I got dizzy trying it out, but <laughs> um, you know, so there's opportunities that we can bring it to to uh, to the classroom. Mm -hmm. Great, excellent. Thank you. Thank you for your work on this. Mm -hmm. That's right. Ellie loves this stuff in global learning, so. Well, uh, thank you to my fellow members for uh, your comments and your input. Um, and I know this is, um, we're, we certainly owe a debt once again for the work that you've done here. Um, you know, certainly in bringing, uh, raising up uh, the field trip policy to the policy level, I know this has existed in various iterations over the years as a circular. Um, and with regard to the international travel, you know, we, we passed a policy in 2011, or I believe it was around 2011, uh, that required all international trips to come through us. And that's because it was, um, there was a wide disparity in the way in which those trips were occurring and the, uh, the types of oversight uh, that, was, um, that was being used to either plan those trips or execute those trips. And so Mr. O'Neill, you know, I know you were on the committee at that time, and you um, well know uh, the, the trips that we're talking about. And since that time, you've had a, a couple of um, individuals that have um, been your predecessors that have worked to um, gradually um, create uh, stronger and uh, repetitive uh, processes that uh, vet these, uh, these trips for, you know, who are the people that are running these trips, uh, where are the children staying, uh, how are they traveling, um, what are the State, state, state Department um, advisories on the countries they're visiting, um, all of the things that make our, our trips safer and, um, and ensure that our kids come back, uh, not only with a, um, with a learning experience, but also um, in one piece. Um, so uh, I think uh, as a committee, we look around and we think about that process, and sometimes it, uh, our part of the process, which is the approval, uh, can get in the way of um, schools planning and uh, executing on those plans, especially when they come up in the short term when there's an opportunity to learn something uh, very quickly. And so I think this is um, the right time to uh, return to the district, uh, those planning uh, opportuni um, th those planning and oversight um, duties. Um, and uh, I think it's a nice trade-off that uh, you've made and the district is making to give us uh, regular um, updates on what those trips look like and give us an annual report on a number of the equity metrics uh, that we're, uh, we're interested in as a district. So um, thank you and I, I uh, wish you good luck um, and I'll look forward or we'll look forward at the next meeting to uh, taking a vote on uh, this policy. And I'll note again, um, Ms. Oliver Davila did have one uh, um, uh, request for an update on uh, the policy and so we'll look forward to seeing uh, that change uh, circulated prior to the vote uh, on November 20th. 
Thank you. All right. And thank you again to Ms. Uh, uh, Lazat, our yes. uh, legal advisor as well, who I know put in quite a bit of work in trying to disentangle these policies and, and make them uh, work for everybody involved. Thank you, Kathy. <laughs> All right. Uh, we'll move on now to uh, our next uh, uh, action, uh, excuse me, report, which is an update to the Code of Conduct. Uh, at this time, uh, Sam DePina, our Secondary Superintendent of School Operations and Safety, who uh, works closely with the Code of Conduct Advisory Committee, is uh, going to step forward with his report. Uh, we don't have slides tonight, um, but Mr. DePina, uh, as he's getting settled, um, I want to remind our members that this update is coming as a result of uh, uh, the request of several members on this committee, myself included, uh, and the Vice Chair as well. Um, after viewing last week's uh, wellness uh, update, and um, that, that update included a, a startling statistic uh, to us, which is mm -hmm. that over 20% of our schools uh, still withhold uh, recess on occasion as a form of punishment. And, you know, given the progressive nature that our district has, uh, um, has taken with respect to the Code of Conduct, our students, uh, BSAC, have uh, certainly led at the State House on Chapter 222, as many of you know. Uh, which is the uh, the state law uh, that was passed a few years ago uh, to uh, reform uh, how code of conduct uh, codes of conduct are uh, implemented in our schools. Um, it's it, it was utterly surprising to each of us, and so um, I give credit, of course, to Mr. DePina and to uh, Superintendent um, Casilius for immediately uh, agreeing to uh, take the step to make sure that our uh, circulars, the superintendent's circulars that are distributed at all schools. Those are the documents that tell our schools how to uh, run various programs. Uh, would specifically note that um, recess is no uh, withholding of recess is no longer to be used as a form of punishment. But you know, upon reflection, our committee felt it pertinent that um, we take the additional step and make sure that that's enshrined in the code, uh, just like um, all of the other uh, progressive steps that we've taken. Uh, over the years, and so I appreciate you coming forward to talk to that uh, that um, goal this evening. And I'll note for our members as well uh, that this is a very limited presentation that uh, Mr. DePine is doing tonight. Code of Conduct Advisory Committee is working with uh, you and with the district on uh, updates to the code. Uh, there haven't been updates in 2016, um, and so we'll look forward in a few more months to a uh, fuller, more comprehensive presentation. Um, and our uh, recommendations. So, sure. hope we didn't take your entire uh, presentation, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> there, there's your intro. <laughs> Good evening, Dr. Leganto and members of the school committee. Um, and, and I also want to just acknowledge uh, our executive team members Absolutely. and school based staff that also weighed in and gave input on this, as well as our Code of Conduct Advisory Council. So, it was a really broad team effort. So, I appreciate um, their work as well. Thank you. So you have in your packet um, some draft language um, regarding the, the change that we uh, came up with. In our code of conduct, there is a section uh, that talks about different alternatives and different interventions that could be used and some that shouldn't be used. So we felt it appropriate to be placed in that section, section four. Um, and the language uh, basically reads, um, and we took a broader approach around physical acti activity in general as well. Mm -hmm. Um, so the proposed language is that the Boston Public Schools strongly believes in supporting and improving the health as well as the social and emotional development of our students. As such, it is prohibited for any BPS staff member to stop students from participating in physical activity, including recess, as disciplinary consequence to provide academic support or for any other reason other, any other, reason other than illness or safety. So that's pretty much um, what we're proposing. Mm -hmm. And with that, I'll open it up for questions. Very good. Thank you, Mr. DePina. Um, <coughs> fellow committee members, are there questions? I could start off. Or comments, of course. Mm -mm. Um, so thank you so much for acting so quickly on this, um, Superintendent, and for all the work. Um, I, my only comment is, and I fully support this, um, I'm just curious about the actual um, conversation with headmasters to translate this down to um, teachers. Um, and I'm hoping that um, the reaction will not be negative, uh, yeah, and that, we, yes, that will have that. Um, and the reason I say that is just that the school leader um, communicate, you know, the reason for this and the, our belief and all of that. Um, so I was just curious about that. 
Yep, so we'll be doing some training at our principals meeting and reviewing the reviewing it with our principals as well as the superintendents will be working with principals on this um, and probably the operational leaders under Sam's leadership will convey uh, this new requirement. I don't think we'll get a lot of pushback on it. Um, I think that, you know, we were also very clear. We had a lot of discussion among the team and with our wellness team on the policy and the particular language. And you'll notice at the end, the last sentence, you know, sometimes students are not, it's not um, taken away just for the um, misbehavior, but also uh, there are times where you could work around the loophole and say you're giving them academic support by keeping them in. Mm -hmm. And so we wanted to be sure that we were very clear that, you know, we believe that children's mental health, their overall social emotional well-being is contingent on getting physical activity. And so that's why you see the expansion to physical activity, not just recess, um, because there's other times where they cancel recess and they're inside during a rain day and they're just working, you know, or they go and use the sensory hallways and they're jumping and that sort of thing. So we just want to make sure that um, we've covered that. And then also to give sup um, the school principals the opportunity to restrict going out for recess if there is uh, a safety issue either during recess um, or uh, be before that, that we would fear that there would be some safety issue um, or illness, obviously. Um, so those are the two exceptions. And I would just add to that that we'd also be working with BTU to make sure we understand the message with them and work with them around educating them on the policy as well. Yeah. Excellent. Mm, sounds good. Other questions, comments? No, good. Thank you. Can I get some more well, yeah, thank you again, Sam, and uh, we'll look forward to taking action on this at the next meeting. And, you know, I think uh, my, my fellow members have uh, made it clear, um, you know, we've, we've talked, uh, I think, in a number of the different um, wellness uh, steps that we've taken over the last uh, couple years, improving access to food and what that, you know, the impact that that has on um, children's uh, behavior and, and um, uh, readiness to learn in the classroom. And I think, you know, <coughs> knowing from my three examples that I have over in the corner there that, you know, sometimes kids might want to get a little exercise and uh, release in order to focus once again. And um, you know, making sure that we have that opportunity and that's and recognize recess as such as an integral part of our our uh, daily uh, educational opportunity is is uh, reinforced here. Overall so uh, we'll. Th I'm sorry. Overall physical activity. Over, over, overall physical activity, indeed. Um, so thank you again. We'll look forward to taking action on the 20th. Thank you very much for taking leadership on the issue. And again, I appreciate you and your team for you know uh, responding so quickly. Okay, I'll uh, move on now to our final report of this evening, which is a 2020 census update. At this time, I'd like to invite uh, Mr. Sebastian Zapata, our census liaison for the city of Boston, with the and uh, a member of the Mayor's Office of Intergovernmental Relations, to please step forward with his report. Good evening, Mr. Zapata. How are you? Good evening. How is everyone tonight? Good. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. I'm glad yeah, we didn't keep you too late. No, no worries. Just happy to be here and start the conversation on how we can uh, get an effective strategy moving forward with the district and the members on the committee itself. Excellent. Well, the floor is uh, So once again, good evening. My name is Sebastian Zapata. I am the census liaison over at Boston City Hall. And on behalf of Mayor Walsh, I'm directing our census efforts around getting an accurate and inclusive count ahead of next year's federal census. Uh, so I, I do understand that, unfortunately, there are no slides being projected, but I do have a deck that's available outside printed and I see that members already have a printed version in front of them as well. So just giving you an update in terms of kind of what is the census, why it matters, what's changed this time around from 10 years ago. Uh, I think for a lot of folks on the committee itself, it's, it's nothing new in terms of why the census matters. Uh, sort of three big themes are around representation, uh, knowing that according to the census count and the data that's provided by the census, uh, our congressional representation will be determined across the country uh, and also the fact that the past few censuses, uh, Massachusetts has lost congressional representation as a, as a result of our count and our historic undercounting throughout the Commonwealth. The next sort of big theme is around redistricting. So all districts from the congressional level to the state level to the local municipal level will all be redrawn based on census data. And I think sort of the third biggest theme that most often folks are sort of paying attention to is the federal funding that stems from the census itself. Uh, so we know that roughly anywhere from $675 billion to $880 billion, depending on 
what figure you want to use, uh, depending on the grants that you want to look at. But nonetheless, uh, billions of federal dollars are at stake here. Mm -hmm. Based on the 2010 count, Massachusetts receives $16 billion a year. Uh, and just sort of to give you an understanding of where that stems or where that goes to, it's the programs and services that most vulnerable folks within our communities depend on. So we're talking about SNAP, Title I education grants, which obviously stem to BPS, special education, uh, free and reduced school lunches and breakfasts, which again, BPS participates within. So there's a lot of programs that are at stake here. Uh, and I, I, all of them are listed, so I won't sort of uh, bemoan the issue. Again, this is all printed in front of you. Uh, just sort of going to the next slide around unique changes this time around, though. It's the first digital census, and sort of what does that mean for Bostonians as a whole? Uh, although, again, I think Boston, as has already been discussed, it's rich in a lot of assets, one of them being uh, internet connectivity and access to that. But nonetheless, we know working with the digital access equity team at Boston City Hall, 20% of Bostonians do not uh, have adoption or broadband internet. So that is a barrier nonetheless in terms of filling out this census overall. And not only about the access to broadband and adoption of it, but also computer literacy is something that we have to take into account. Uh, also, there's severe reduced funding this time around for the census operation. Essentially, the Census Bureau has a, a level budget from 10 years ago. And if you've ever worked with a budget, understanding that this dollars from 10 years ago and today's dollars terms is a massive cut. And I think sort of another big issue that we have to deal with is around the, the sort of misinformation about the citizenship question. I think for a lot of this year, most of the attention that's been paid to the citizenship or to the census has been around the citizenship question. Uh, so I would like to just give the the, the phenomenal understanding. Just the, the citizenship question will not be on next year's census form overall. But nonetheless, what does that mean around misinformation and fear around filling out your census form? So it's just something that we've been trying to keep in mind uh, at City Hall. And unfortunately, again, Boston historically has not done a phenomenal job of counting all of its residents. And that's mostly due to the fact that we have a lot of what's deemed hard to count populations. And what basically what that means is that it's a response rate of 73% or less of an census tract. Uh, Boston itself, it's the ninth hardest city to count among the 100 largest US cities. Roughly 63% of all Bostonians live in a hard census tract. Uh, so when you think about the fact that Boston has about roughly 180 census tracts, 100 of them are deemed hard to count. And so again, that just means 73% or less uh, inhabitants in that census tract respond to the mail itself. And we, again, that's sort of to say the fact that also we have some census tracts that respond to rates of 50% through the mail. Uh, and so when you think about Boston's populations and sort of what is hard to count populations overall in demographics, you're talking about renters. Approximately two-thirds of all Bostonians are renters. You're talking about the fact of recent immigrants. We're a city of roughly 30% uh, of our immigrants. When you talk about Boston public schools, we know that at least 50% of all Boston public school students have one parent that's foreign born. We have many folks that speak different languages across the city of Boston itself. Uh, we also talk about children under the age of five and sort of low income and low educational attainment folks. Uh, and although these people, are, I, I believe, is what makes Boston such a phenomenal New York City and every single day a tribute to the social fabric and make it so strong, nonetheless, they are historically undercounted. Uh, and in the next slide, it gives a really great representation of what we're talking about from a geographical spatial setting. So the map in front of you are the return rates from 2010. And the way to interpret that map is the redder it is, the lower the return rate was from 2010. And therefore, the more harder to count these folks are, or the more historically harder to count of they've gone in the past. And sort of what I'll switch over to next is sort of some of the efforts that we've done at City Hall to date. So we do have a web page that's chock full of a bunch of resources, including a one-pager that's been translated into five different languages, which are Spanish, Chinese, Vietnamese, Haitian Creole, and Cape Verdean Creole, which are the top five requested languages for translation in the city of Austin. Uh, so something that we've been thinking about a lot is around language access itself. How do we be better at that at City Hall? And I think this is a phenomenal opportunity to do that through the census and sort of how do we message the census to all of our residents, knowing that we have so many different languages spoken throughout the city of Boston. And something that I'm really proud to announce is the fact that Mayor Walsh has invested $100,000 into the operation of getting an accurate and inclusive count in the census, the vast majority of which those dollars will be going back into the doors of community-based organizations to fund grassroots campaign education or campaign educational campaigns. Uh, the approach that we're taking here is the fact that oftentimes the most trusted voices 
are the ones at the very local level. We're talking about your faith leader, your Main Street director, uh, someone who works at a community development corporation, a teacher or an instructor or administrator at Boston Public Schools themselves. Uh, so we do have 13 grantees selected. Uh, very soon we'll be making a public announcement as to who they are. But I did just want to say the fact that I, I appreciate Mayor Walsh's investment into this. Not uh, many cities have the fortunate uh, coffers to do that, but Mayor Walsh does, and he recognized the importance of getting an accurate count, hence why we made this investment. Uh, we also have a complete count committee, which is about 25 different individuals, all external stakeholders that are kind of brain trust, if you will, around how do we actually attribute, uh, what does a complete accurate count look like? And each member is faced with forming a subcommittee of their own that they'll help chair. So we have 15 different subcommittees, all sort of comprised of large institutions throughout the city of Boston. So for example, healthcare, higher education, uh, homelessness and housing, children and youth, uh, which is being held by investors, is being run by investors, and Director of Communications for Boston Public Schools, Jessica Ridlin, has agreed to participate on that. We also have an internal working group at City Hall, which uh, your, your fellow BPS IGR person, Ellen McDonough, has participated on since the conception of it. Uh, so this is to say that BPS uh, has been involved to date and will continue to be involved. Uh, and again, sort of the next slide is talking more about that involvement from BPS themselves. The next couple of months is sort of doing an internal thought process of how can we engage students. Uh, a few other cities across the country, they've done some uh, engagement with their public schools around could students design a, a logo or a poster that can hang up within the school systems themselves to sort of get students acclimated to the idea of it. And the next few months sort of detail sort of strategies around how do we actually talk to parents about it through a series of medias, whether it's social, uh, mailers, phone calls, text. I think anecdotally from my, my previous experience as, as a son of immigrant parents going through public schools, Oftentimes, it's the child that's the interpreter. It's the translator for parents that's saying, you know, what, you know, mijo, what is this piece of paper that I just received in the mail? Can you please explain this to me? And so that's something that I recognize, and we, at City Hall, we recognize very early on, is the fact that it's, although, yes, it's anecdotal, again, considering the population of Boston public school students, it's probably going to be the same case this time around, nonetheless. So just keeping in mind, how do we can continue to communicate with the parents, but also the children that are being serviced by Boston public schools? Uh, and sort of to wrap it all up, it's, it's really about overcoming some of the obstacles. And I know I've, if this is a brief presentation, and I'm more happy to go at length with questions or follow-up conversations. Uh, but it's about overcoming obstacles through partnerships as much as possible. I think the folks that sit on this committee itself uh, are well-versed with what the census is. I know Dr. Rivera herself, so the Gaston Institute, has been doing census work with different communities around the Commonwealth. Uh, I know uh, Member O'Neill. And Member Oliveira de Oija has also been doing some stuff around census. Uh, so I, I think for a lot of these people that, that are sort of both within this room today but outside of it, they're trusted voices. People turn to you and ask, hey, what's going on with this or that? What's the census thing I'm hearing about? Why is it so vital that I participate? Uh, and it could be a series of messages, but nonetheless it's about creating as many different touch points as possible uh, through BPS being one of the large institutions and players for a lot of these communities that historically do go undercounted. Uh, and, and I think, again, it's also about reiterating the fact that your data is secure from an individual perspective. There's Title 13 on the US Code, which says that your individual data will never be shared with any governmental agency office at any level, whether it's at the State Department or your landlord or Mayor Walsh, whomever it is, your individual data will never be shared. Hence why, from that perspective, it is, shared to, it is safe to share your data. And again, it, going back to the federal funding, the redistricting, and sort of the, the distribution of power when it comes to the Electoral College and seats at the congressional level, it's so vital that we all participate. I think in the climate that Washington has presented uh, in this day and age, it's, it's extremely important that we all sort of coalesce around the fact that this is a direct form of democracy that we can all feel safe to participate in and we should participate in. Because unfortunately, if we are not counted through this federal census, we stand to lose a lot of things. Uh, and so thank you again for your time, and I'll stop here for questions. Well, thank you, Mr. Zapata, and I'll open it up now to members for questions and discussion. Mr. O'Neill. Just a real quick comment. Thank you, Mr. Zapata. Um, for your, I, I, we can't uh, overestimate how important this is for us. 
and it is very clear there's been a concerted effort in Washington to undercount, particularly in urban districts. So we have to fight fire with fire. I love the work you're doing here. I do want to point out when you talk about how to engage students, I think we can do a lot more than just ask them to design a poster. Mm -hmm. And I'd love to see BSAC get involved in this because if there's one person that's actually trusted by parents to talk about this is the, is the students and teachers, mm -hmm. yeah. right? And I know the census department is gonna be hiring a lot of part-time workers who will be going door to door. Um, so obviously the big thing is there's gonna be a lot of fear about census workers coming to the door. Mm -hmm. And so first the effort has to be on getting people to fill out the form. If you fill out the form, no one comes to your door. But how, so how do we get that up front? And how do we engage students? Can we get them hired as part-time workers? Can we somehow figure out an effort where they're being paid to actually do a lot of the door-to-door -door work, particularly in multilingual communities? As you referenced as well, the students office often act as translators. Mm -hmm. So I, I think you know, how, the more we mobilize students on this, the better beyond just designing posters. I 100% agree, and I, and I welcome BSAC's input into this, and I'm, I'm happy to work with them along the way. I think around hiring, it's, it's unfortunately those that are 18 or older can actually apply to be a census worker themselves. But that's not to say that that's every single student that is not of that age. I think certainly there is a population that is above the age of 18 that this could be a phenomenal temporary gig for them. Uh, well, excuse me, but that, that's the federal government hiring, right? Yes, correct. So can the city hire people that are 16 and above as an example to do this part time? I don't know, but I can certainly look into that. Thank you, Mr. O'Neill. Dr. Rivera. Oh, yes. So thank you again for the wonderful work that you're doing. Um, I was curious, and again, we're work is my other hat, but my, we're working in the city of Chelsea and also with the public schools there where they're going to actually set up, you know, like pop-up centers with laptops and, and have, you know, within the schools that, that kind of safe environment, especially for undocumented populations that are worried. I'm curious if that's something you're also thinking about doing and sort of utilizing the schools as a space for, um, for answering the, the census. Uh, yes, absolutely. Um, so again, a lot of what you see is very initial. It's, it's not baked. It's not even half baked. I think it's still very raw cookie dough. Uh, but nonetheless, I invite these kind of conversations to sort of start the dialogue of what can we do. I think sort of a model that we're looking at, not necessarily through BPS, but through our public libraries and through our Boston Centers Youth and Families, is how do we designate those as census centers or sort of census sites, if you will, where we already have designated technology that can be put aside in certain days and hours that folks can sort of feel comfortable going in if they have questions or at least have that piece of designated technology that they might not have or if they're not extremely computer literate, sort of be able to sat, sit down with front-facing staff and sort of walk them through the process. Uh, I think something like that can certainly be done in BPS, if allowable. Thank you, Dr. Rivera. <coughs> Ms. Reyes. Yes. Um, so Mr. O'Neill took the words right out of my mouth. I was going to say <laughs> it's OK. <laughs> but definitely students um, were here. And I think that a lot of us, I know certainly some of my friends have already started talking about the census and sort of what it means to them. So we definitely know about it. We're ready to participate in any capacity, um, especially BSAC. We're here and we're ready to work. Um, and I'm also curious about how the opportunities to work for the census are being advertised. So the census themselves, again, this is, this is all federal hiring, I'm assuming is, is what the question gets at. Uh, in terms of their sort of employment, they're looking a lot through different agencies and pretty much anywhere they can go, they're looking for space to advertise on. Uh, I will say it's a very tight labor market in terms of the fact that it's extremely low in employment right now. The latest numbers in Suffolk County, they're about 18% to goal of recruitment and they're starting to sort of wrap up those operations in January. So unfortunately, they're, they're quite behind their goal. Um, so if you have any ideas around how you can sort of boost that the awareness that these census jobs do exist for folks as a potential part-time job that does pay quite well in Suffolk County for $25 an hour, uh, I'd be more than happy to have that conversation. Okay, um, for sure. I think that there's definitely, because I haven't personally seen any advertisement anywhere. Um, and I know that I personally can't take the job because I'm under 18, but still, I think that there are plenty of like community spaces that could be used 
to advertise this. I don't think that it needs to necessarily just go through agencies because that's not going to get as far as it needs to. But thank you. Um, and definitely, I would like to have that conversation at some point. Yeah. Thank you, Ms. Reyes. Vice Chair. Uh, thank you, Sebastian. I think um, this work is really, really important, and it cannot be understated that we need to um, do this count. Um, I won't repeat what they've said, um, but I will say that uh, in terms of the grant for the $100,000, <laughs> maybe you can give BSAC a grant. I think that would be um, a way that you can uh, give dollars to the young people working because I do think what Mr. O'Neill said um, and you reiterated earlier is really the trust is with the children and their parents uh, and many times they are translating. So if we start here explaining that this is a safe thing to do and the young people are translating that and taking that home to their families. Um, I think being able to stipend youth um, to be ambassadors of this and if we can even think about having this in you know, social studies or um, wherever it's appropriate. Um, and also um, there is Success Boston ha is working with lots of college students um, that are here that could use like that part-time work so I think that would be a great way to connect some of them to be census workers but thank you so much and uh, please continue the work and my last thing is on the I know that um, the children and youth subcommittee I'm wondering if there's any students on that um, even just students who have just graduated to just hear like the youth voice of ideas because I know it's going to be a lot of adults and really you know the young people have much better ideas than any of us do any day of the week uh, so I have to look through exactly who sort of RSVP to this point to sort of see if there is any specific youth involved. We have reached out to the mayor's office of youth engagement to have them involved or have them come on board and be involved to sort of be that representative youth voice. Uh, but that's not to say that this is sort of who's ever at this first meeting. That's who's ever going to be there for the rest of the eternity of this meeting schedule. Yep. One of the primary questions we ask at to the, sub the subcommittees when they kick off is, who is in this room or who is not in this room that should be uh, is always the initial question that we ask. And so I think pretty quickly on when you talk about children and youth and you sort of look around the room and there's actually a representative from that sort of specifically stating that this is directly towards children and youth, I think someone would very quickly identify who that is. Great. I would definitely folks. love to see some youth on that. I know maybe if meetings are, I'm not sure if they're going to be during the day or in the evening, um, but there's also a subset of you know alternative education students that are older that maybe have more flexibility I don't know um, but I think there's different avenues if we're talking about a children and youth subcommittee to bring ideas forward I, I think we need to have youth voice on that so thank you thank you vice chair superintendent you want to say a few words? yes I just want to thank you for your work on this it is so important for us as a a school district uh, to get these resources in for our students and I just wanted to make sure you're aware that we have a showcase coming up for our parents and that's an opportunity to be there and provide information so I want to make sure you're connecting with Rob Consalvo our intergovernmental um, senior advisor as well as Monica Roberts in our chief of advancement office I think that uh, there are opportunities uh, with our schools with some of the events we're doing and convening parents um, to provide information. I was also wondering and had a question about um, practice forms. You know how you practice voting? Mm -hmm. <laughs> are there practice forms that parents can have to familiarize themselves with the form so it's not so tedious? And if so, um, is there a way for us to get those uh, out and do trainings for our parents at some of our parent nights and things that we do um, because the April 1st census day I think is really close to our registration time that parents actually choose schools and there may be an opportunity I don't know Monica if there's opportunity to tie those two events together when parents register also doing um, the census so there might be some opportunities for us to be more intentional with you I just don't know um, because lots of parents are registering their children for school for the upcoming school year and that might be a, a good place to get some information I just don't know if the timing works together uh, I, I think the timing does work uh, just to give you all a sense of the timeline overall for the census operation so mid-march is when you will receive an invitation to participate 
and uh, up until the end of July of 2020 is when you can actually be counted. So there's, there's ample opportunity in terms of trying to figure out an event uh, that might already exist through BPS or potentially putting on something else outside of existing events. Uh, and to answer your question around sort of sample forms, uh, yes, sample forms do exist, so I'm happy to share that resource. They're both in English and in Spanish. Um, are they in Haitian Creole or other languages? And potentially our staff could help with some of that. I don't believe the form itself. So the form itself, the paper form, will not be translated outside of English or Spanish. Uh, online, you will be able to respond in up to 12 non-English languages, as well as over the phone in up to 12 non-English languages. Uh, as of today, they did, the Census Bureau, produce a series of language guides of how you could actually fill out the form itself. Uh, and I believe many of the languages that are pertinent to the city of Boston are on there. Do we know if the form is easy? Or have they changed it at all in the in this so, uh, new administration? I mean, uh, easy is subjective, of course. I mean, depending on your computer literacy skills. But it's only 10 questions. So the Census Bureau has determined that it would take the average person between 10 and 12 minutes. Uh, I think more on the lengthy side, depending on how many folks you have in your household. Uh, but nonetheless, I think to your point around how we can best prepare parents ahead of time, it's by giving them sort of these sample ballots, as well as I'm giving some snapshots of what the online test survey looked like, mm -hmm. so that the, if they do chose the online option, they sort of are familiarized of what the layout will look like ahead of time. Okay, thank you. Of course. Thank you, Superintendent. Uh, well, you know, Mr. Zapata, thank you for giving us this uh, comprehensive uh, uh, but very uh, compact uh, presentation. And uh, I know uh, I appreciate you recognizing a number of my colleagues that have been working on this um, uh, this very important uh, endeavor uh, already. And, um, you know, li listening to a number of the uh, pieces of advice that we've been able to give tonight, um, I know we've got a number of folks here that are uh, busy working on behalf of the district, Ms. Ridland, Ms. Scott, um, in uh, formulating what our communications plan will be and how we're going to be able to best interact with uh, uh, both City Hall and the federal government on the uh, on the census. Because again, you know, you, you started out um, by noting how important this is um, and the different ways in which um, we're counted and how, what effect that has in the way that we're represented in D.C., but also in the, uh, the way that we receive money. Um, you know, Medicare, Medicaid are, are the two big ones that I think m many of us think about. But um, so many of the benefits that so many of our students and our families within the district receive through SNAP and uh, Section 8 and uh, the, the Title I uh, funds that we receive directly as a district all count so much on, on uh, our, our census count. So um, we're, uh, we're happy to support this in any way we can, and we thank you for raising awareness about it here tonight. Absolutely. Happy to do so. Be a resource however possible. And thank you again for your time. Thank you. Thank and you know where to find us if you need anything else. Mm -hmm. Thank you. All right. I'll move on now to public comments on report. Ms. Sullivan. Ms. Wakanda, we have no speakers or public comment. Excellent. Uh, thank you. Uh, is there new business from the committee? Mr. O'Neill? I may just bring up uh, two points, uh, mainly for the superintendent's benefit and, and knowing that you were not around when these first happened. I do just want to make sure to mention that um, with regards to the McCormick School, when the previous interim superintendent first proposed to close the school, there was a, and that it would ultimately merge with another high school, there was a pretty big uproar. And a lesson learned from the community was to involve that school at the outset to have them at the table. Uh, superintendent Perrill, or interim superintendent Perrill, to her credit, went back and actually did that and ended up with a substantially revised proposal. And that the McCormick community bought into, and that's the merger with BCLA. So she actually did a really good job with that, and it was a lesson learned for us that when we're facing big issues with schools, it's better to get them involved earlier. I know you know this, but it's also important for me to say this out loud. So I would love if you, um, and, and I know you, thank you for speaking out tonight and saying the Jackson Man community give you a couple of weeks. I know you're learning. You already know the issues there. You and I toured the building together. We saw the classrooms that are shut because of rain, et cetera. Um, but the more we can do to involve that community up front, uh, and, and as they talked about transparency and clarity, the better. And the second point is regarding the McGill McCormick Field House. Um, thank you for the uh, person who spoke out tonight in public comment. Remind us, this committee very specifically said that the McCormick community was to be consulted 
and that we have to see a benefit for BPS students. And I'm not speaking to you on this, Superintendent. I'm speaking to the general. Uh, I trust that this committee will continue to have those expectations that the McCormick community has talked about this. I know there was a meeting just last week with members of the McCormick community for, unfortunately, the first time. I hope that's the first of many. Um, but also, to me, the key test on this is going to be what's the benefit to BPS students, most, most particularly the students in the Dever and the McCormick, um, because that was a specific condition that this committee put on our approval. And I, for one, would intend to use that as a criteria that I view any recommendation that ultimately comes to this, to this body. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. O'Neill. Is there any other new business? Okay. Uh, well, that concludes our business for this evening. School committee will hold a retreat in these chambers next Wednesday at 5.30 p.m., November 13th. Uh, as a reminder, it's an open meeting, and all are uh, welcome. Public comment will be included. Uh, and that will be followed the following week by a school committee meeting uh, that will take place at its regular time, uh, Wednesday, November 20th at 6 p.m. If there's nothing further, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Thank you, uh, Ms. Robinson. Looks like unanimous consent. Good night. Thank you.